Good evening and welcome to The Report with me, John Rees. The newly elected parliament in Burma met for the first time today, three months after opposition leader Aung San Suu Kyi won a landslide election victory. Tonight we ask if the country is on its way to democracy. We'll also be looking at Nigeria, where 86 people, including a number of children, have been killed in a series of attacks allegedly carried out by Boko Haram. But first, the Syrian peace talks remain in limbo as renewed efforts by the United Nations in Geneva produced little headway. However, the UN Special Envoy to Syria has begun, finally, talking with the opposition after they initially said that they'd boycott the talks. Afsal Ahmed has more. The Syrian government delegation left the hotel in Geneva after the meeting with the United Nations Special Envoy was delayed until further notice. The meeting was supposed to be held at the UN building as part of negotiations that were about to kick off. But a statement issued by the UN said that the meeting had been postponed and the only one to be held would be with the Saudi-backed opposition delegation. The opposition said earlier that it wouldn't enter political negotiations with President Bashar al-Assad's government until there were concrete measures in place that would alleviate the humanitarian situation on the ground. Farah Atassi, another opposition member, said the unprecedented escalation of violence in Syria meant that it was impossible for them to engage in negotiation with the regime. This actually is an insult for the United Nations. It's an insult for all the efforts, the regime, what they're doing. Uh, uh, is blowing off all these international efforts really to push for a serious negotiation or to push for the political transition. We, we can't go on like this under, under the bombing. To be honest, there is no national Syrian can go and, and, and start negotiate with the regime that killing his own people, that bombing his people, that uh, 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 hitting 52 barrels in, in less than one hour. This is unprecedented. Yesterday, the Syrian ambassador to the UN, Bashar Jafari, who is leading the government delegation in Geneva, said Damascus was open to discussing humanitarian concerns. He added, however, that such issues should be debated as part of the talks and not ahead of them. Branding the opposition as terrorists backed by foreign powers, Jafari said the government would not accept preconditions for negotiations. Like any other government in the world, has the duty to protect its own, its own people, to protect its own territory, and to show to everybody that those who are imposing on the Syrian uh, people this kind of bloodshed are not Syrians. There, there are foreign powers endorsing foreign agendas aiming at making political pressure on the Syrian government by using terrorism as a political weapon. The exchange of words come as the UN said there should be no amnesty for people suspected of committing war crimes. Zaid Rad al-Hussein, the top UN human rights official, maintained that the deliberate starvation of Syrians in places such as in the town of Madaya was a potential war crime and a crime against humanity. The announcement comes after at least 45 people were killed and 110 others wounded when two explosions rocked a Shia district in Damascus yesterday, which was protected by members of the Lebanese fighter group Hezbollah. The first explosion was caused by a car bomb attack that ripped through the Al Sudan street in the area. After that, a person detonated his explosive belt in a crowd of people who had gathered at the blast site. The attack comes as the Russian Defense Ministry released drone footage of new airstrikes in Syria. Video showed strikes hitting targets in the provinces of Aleppo, Hama and Latakia. Russia's Defense Ministry says the Air Force has carried out 468 sorties in Syria over the past week, hitting more than 1,300 targets. The UN is aiming for six months of negotiations. It will first seek a ceasefire and then later work towards a political settlement to a civil war that has killed over 250,000 people, driven more than 10 million people from their homes and drawn in global powers. Afsal Ahmed, The Report. Now joining me to discuss this from London is political commentator Sabah al Mukhtar and on the line Paul Schult, who's a security expert and honorary professor at the University of Birmingham. Uh, welcome to the programme, both of you. Um, Sabah, um, the opposition, first they were going, then they were boycotting, and now they're kind of going to a room next to where negotiations are happening. What's going on? <laughs> 
Well, quite frankly, I don't think there would there was any plan that they would meet face to face. Right from the outset, the idea was that they would be sitting in two different places, and the Mitsura would be going between the two sides. This is the the uh, the the way it was planned. The problem they had is that initially. Uh, the Mistura has given quite a lot of assurances about the bombing, about the re release of the detainees, about the, uh, the blockade which is now imposed on the areas, uh, only to be told by the U.S. that these things are really matters that can be discussed in the Human Rights Council. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, you have the Russian bombers are going all over Syria, which is bombing everything inside that is against the regime. It doesn't matter whether they are ISIS, they are Christians, they are the uh, uh, Syrian Free Army, or anybody who's against the regime in Syria. So because of this uh, tug of war between the US and Russia, the opposition and the government, each one of them is relying on uh, somebody to support them. The opposition was relying on the idea that the Saudis and the Americans were supporting them. Uh, only to be told at the very last minute, yes, there are assurances we will deal that. When they got to, to Geneva, the Mistura has said that, well, we will first of all discuss the arrangements rather than the humanitarian. Of course, the humanitarian issue is important, but it is not to be discussed at this stage. We want to get the discussions going on. So it's really uh, everybody is jostling for power, the U.S., the Russians, the U.N., the opposition, the government in Syria, everybody is trying to uh, put their mark uh, on, on the scene. I think the discussions will go on, but I don't think it's going at this stage. It doesn't look as if they can get anything concrete. If you're going to uh, not stop the Russians from bombing, you're not going to uh, lift the blockade on the civilians in Syria. The, ra the Syrian government is going to continue using the bombing, and at the same time, the opposition are going to continue using the force. But I think this is a process. Hopefully, it will lead to some further discussions. Mm. Uh, Paul, what do you reckon? Is it going to get started? I mean, let's leave aside whether it's going to produce anything, but is it going to get properly started, this set of talks? Well, in the last few minutes, I've seen a news item saying that the Mistura, the UN diplomat leading this, has met the High Negotiating Committee on the rebel side. Um, so to the extent that the, the this that we're talking about is proximity talks, where the two sides hate each other so much that they won't sit down in the same room, but you can have diplomats shuttling between them. Um, that That's what we mean by the process. I think that will begin, and it, it, I, arguably it has already begun in a tiny, tentative way. And this is expected to go on probably for months. Mm. Um, it's... And at the same time, there's a kind of bombardment of atrocity and uh, attempts, say, the other side are behaving worse than ever, and that people are dying of starvation and suicide bombs, all of which is true. Um, but the, 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 it's like there's a kind of dust cloud of outrage, which, which is being deliberately boiled up by, by both sides. And then, of course, you have Daesh outside it, which... Uh, has been told it cannot be part of the negotiations with the Al Nusra Front as well. So they don't care. They want to legitimate, they want to delegitimate the, the entire process. And they've gone into a serious acceleration of their suicide bombing campaign. So I think it's, it's sadly like a lot of these um, problems in other internal wars. The beginning of negotiations tends to lead to an increase in violence and death. Mm. Do you think that the kind of um, stumbling block to them starting properly, i.e. some kind of cessation of the, of the blockades and the sieges, um, do you think that's at all likely to happen when uh, the government and the Russians seem to have the initiative? I think it might be fudged and um, uh, managed so that there is a change in patterns on the ground which will never be enough for the high negotiating committee, but they may be persuaded by the Americans and the UN and the Saudis that, that come on, let's, let's use this as at least an opportunity to start. And, and it will give them an opportunity to press their demands, which are about um, prisoner release, as, as well as the, um, the, the letting through of food into, by the regime into besieged cities. So I think there may be very unsatisfactory, tiny movements, but movements nonetheless. 
Mm. Uh, Sabah, um, how big a problem is it that the Turkish uh, PYD were excluded from the talks? I don't think it's a, it's a major issue because there are a number of uh, factions that have been excluded. Uh, the regime didn't want some of the uh, parties who are taking, who are some of the people who are taking part. The opposition themselves, they had vetoes on others. The Americans have their vetoes. The Russians have their vetoes. So I think it is, uh, 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 it's not important, the absence of the Kurdish movement at the present moment. I think eventually they are part of the whole settlement. But I think, as Mr. Schultz was uh, talking about, uh, the, the main issue is that the humanitarian tragedy is going to continue because now, at the present moment, the biggest culprit are the Russian bombing and the Syrian government bombing from the air, the barrels, as well as the blockade on the civilians. These things are, the, the, the bombing by the Russians, certainly the Russians are not going to give on that one, having got the Americans to give them the green light right from the outset when they allowed them because the Americans thought it was good if you get the Russians there so that because they have the fixation of ISIS and they thought that Russia is going to get rid of ISIS and Russia is getting rid of every, everybody along the way. Uh, I think the Russians are not likely to stop because they are keen on retaining the government in Damascus with Assad or without Assad. The person is no longer important, but it's the system that they want to retain there. I think as far as the humanitarian issue, there may be a little bit of a relief, but until now, it doesn't look as if they are taking the actual practical steps to either lift the blockade, allow food and medicine, and get people out. There is the main issue which the opposition wants to talk about, which is not likely to be discussed at this stage, and that is the uh, enforcement of uh, paragraph 12 and 13 of the UN Security Council Resolution 2254, which calls for the transition and the government leaves and what have you. This is unlikely to be at this stage discussed because they are still having the humanitarian issue being dis addressed. Mm. Uh, Paul, do you agree with that, you, that it's relatively unimportant that the uh, Kurds have been excluded? Because, I mean, if you got your information about this conflict from the British press, you would have thought at least a little while back they're the main people doing the fighting. Why wouldn't they be at the table? Um, because the, the Turks hate them as a, an active force in the region and want to marginalise them, and they're active behind the scenes. And the... They're, they're inconvenient for the regime, and I suppose in a sort of um, strange uh, way, because they have behaved, although they've been far from perfect, they've done their own massacres, apparently, they, they are somewhat less murderous than other groups, um, which is necessary to get international support and sympathy, but it, it, it makes them uh, not so indispensable to this this kind of um, conversation that you know be, because they're regarded as moderate they might be part of a later um, complicated quilt solution but they they're not essential because they're not going to uh, uh, obdurately block any possible progress with violence at this stage mm. uh, and Paul uh, finally uh what do you think the impact of this is going to be immediately on the humanitarian situation? Do you think that it will, perhaps not within days, but within weeks, beginning to um, open up some possibilities for relief? I think it will immediately increase expectations and hope in the area. How, however much there are warnings against that, um, people will feel at last um, starvation can be stopped, barrel bombing can be reduced, if not ended. And uh, whether that happens, we've yet to see. But it, it, it gives a, a very, very cautious ray of hope. Mm. OK, well, uh, I'm afraid we'll have to leave that uh, part of the discussion there. But we're going to talk about Syria a little bit more with our political correspondent, Khalil Charles, who's been looking at the wider reaction to the Syrian talks. Uh, Khalil, so um, if you were to sum it up, how have the first kind of stutters of these talks 
um, been going down. I think the word is disappointing. I, th I think most people are not very encouraged by what's happened, and there is a, a feeling with pes pessimism about uh, the likelihood of, of, of any real success in these talks at the moment. Um, is that from the big powers as well as everybody else? Yes, indeed. I mean, certainly on the on the, the feeds that we're getting getting across the social media, um, people um, have been saying that uh, you know such and such shouldn't be included, and that's a, a fair a way of of, of 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 you know making the talks fail before they actually start. If you look at what the Americans are saying, John Kerry uh, tweeted uh, uh, and said the people of Syria deserve a choice about the kind of future they want, not a choice between repression and terrorists. And so uh, he took that opportunity to, to put out a, a video in which he talked about the bringing a ceasefire, talked about the humanitarian crisis, and also a political deal which he's talking about happening within the case of about 18 months' time. So Kerry's trying to set the stall, and he's also was very critical of, of the Assad regime, uh, talking about uh, having 113 humanitarian requests. Only 13 of them have been approved by the Assad re re regime. And I think the others who are, are talking about this, and I think it's been reflected by our two commentators, Sabah and uh, Paul Schultz today, they have been saying how the agenda, if you like, of different uh, forces means that certain people are left out and certain people are included. There's certainly a feeling by, by, by Navanda, Navanda uh, Mahmoud. Now, he says in his tweet, to, to, sad to see the Syrian talks hijacked by both the Russians and the Turks. Uh, and both are fighting their own war at the expense of the Syrian people. So I think people do feel there's a, a wider agenda here. And of course, regrettably, the bombing and the killing is, is continuing. We have reports of uh, 56 barrel bombs, 56 barrel bombs uh, coming into a town called Mudeima, Mudeimaya, uh, uh, in Syria today, uh, and obviously with, with, with immense casual casualties. And that's the Syrian regime uh, uh, undertaking that, that, those attacks. There were reports also so outside Damascus, the IS said they were responsible for, for, for attacks against uh, uh, Syrians in that area. So this, with the fighting continuing, with the lack of, uh, if you like, push towards humanitarian relief, it's clear that uh, there's going to be some very difficult days ahead. And people who are talk, um, for, like organizations like Oxfam, now we must remember um, this Thursday, there's going to be a, a donors meeting in, w in which uh, Oxfam and others and the, the World Food Organization, etc., uh, and Human Rights Watch are going to be asking people, asking the donors to do more, to increase their input into Syria and to put down a timetable and, a, a, and a, if you like, a structure of how uh, the Syrians are going to be helped with this mm. issue. So that's a very important thing coming around. And for, uh, Oxfam has said ahead of that that the people who are involved in military conflict, i.e. the big guns, Russia, Iran, etc., um, and Britain, uh, you, uh, the United States and its allies are not doing enough in terms of the humanitarian needs. And they've already put some, made that statement quite clear. And I think people are jostling for position as well, John, because if you look at what the United Nations Human Rights Chief said, he says that there is no amnesty, absolutely none, for war crimes. So it looks like they're going to go after people who they believe have committed war crimes, and there'll be absolutely no, 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 no room in the talks to let people off the, 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 the terrible uh, situation I mean, that's, that's going to be a pretty messy process, though. I mean, not, you know, perhaps a desirable one, but a pretty messy one, seeing various reports have accused what pretty much every side of uh, of some kind of war crime during the course of um, this. Unfortunately so. It's, it's been a horrendous five years for the Syrian people and the, and the kind of things that have, that have gone on and that we've seen on the social media, some horrific stuff has, uh, has, has gone on. So yes, it's going to be very, very difficult. But I think the United Nations are setting out their store from the very, very beginning and saying, well, we're not going to accept any negotiation on these issues. And we also have the criticism coming from a Syrian-backed uh, uh, um, um, website called Syria Between the Lines. They they tweeted to say, by bringing in Jason Islam into the Syria talks, this shows that the opposition backers are eager to, for the talks to fail. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and and failure would of course mean that. Uh, Do you think there's a certain sort of air of, of unreality about talks like that? Because while it would no doubt be uh, enormously to the benefit of everybody if there weren't outside interference in Syria, we left that point some time ago. I mean, there was a, a pre-conference in Saudi, so that the, the, the so-called moderate opposition are, are basically Saudi-approved. In, indeed. As we've heard, the Turks have vetoed uh, the Kurds. 
from attending. Um, the regime has its own vetoes. The Americans have theirs. I mean, what we're reduced to is a set of talks where you know pretty much everybody's knocked somebody out before it began. John, I think you're absolutely right. I think it's difficult now for us to say that the solution can come solely and wholly from the Syrian people. It will be nice to think that the Syrian people and those who represent them could actually get together uh, together with, with, with all the representatives and, and, and talk. But that doesn't seem very likely. Paul Schultz talked about in the interview this and, and and Sabah also that this are, these are proximity talks. These are never going to be expected that these two, these two sides to are going to be face to face. They're going to be talking from from behind the lines, if you if you like, and putting forward their, their, their points of view. The, now the the, the higher um, um, negotiation council has released their statement, and they are banging on about uh, clause 2254 in the United Nations, in which that demands some certain things to happen. And I think Sabah expressed doubt of whether that would be, but that's for the seizures, the seizures the bombardment and the release of political detainees, as well as to stop the, 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 the bombing that's happening to civilians. I mean, they made a statement uh, uh, yesterday saying uh, since the beginning of the so-called talks, there's been at least 47 civilians alone that have died during, during, during this. So people, if people continue to die while the talks are taking place, that will surely put the talks in jeopardy. Okay, a long road to travel. No doubt we'll Indeed. be reporting on it. Uh